Welcome back to the Shared Practices Podcast. This is season four on case acceptance, yet another episode from Voices of Dentistry, hands down my favorite meeting in dentistry because it was just nonstop people that I know and love and great interviews and great conversations. We brought back Adam McWethy from Spear Education. And Adam blows my mind because he talks like he's a dentist because essentially his education in clinical dentistry has been Spear Education. He devoured all of the online content, built the education platform. So of of all the non-dentists that I've ever talked to in my entire life, I feel like he he just gets it. He gets advanced treatment. He gets the little things that dentists struggle with. It's just a lot of fun. And uh, it was fun because we recorded this at the Dental Hacks booth. And I know that Alan and Jason both love Adam as well. So we were very grateful to get him back on the show. We talk about the book on case acceptance from Spear Education, and we will have a link in the show notes on this one. We finally have a custom link for that. And, and you'll even hear me like, I read the book before doing this interview, and I had some stuff highlighted and written down. And there's actually a spot in the interview where I try to quote a really great like checklist scenario thing that, that Frank goes through. And I totally read like the wrong part. There's so many good things in this book. You just got to get it for yourself. There's no way that we could just read the whole book on a podcast episode. Hopefully, you'll get a better understanding of what's in there from this and some application of it and, and some specific role playing. So once again, another episode where you get to hear me uh, butcher some role playing and lay it out there because you can hear that I'm I'm still learning and applying these specific things is hard for me too. So you're, you're not alone there. So we will get to this interview with Adam McWethy. Some people wonder how Blue Sky Bio can offer such great implants at a significantly lower cost than some of the name brand companies. And Corey Glenn posted, he said that the Sunshine Act allows you to go and see where all these implant companies' money goes. And they want you to believe that the price difference is research and saving orphans, but in reality, the difference is expenditure in reps, marketing, key opinion leader payments, big facilities, big events. And Blue Sky Bio just doesn't do any of that stuff and it allows them to pass the savings on to you as customers. It's a purely web-based company. I was trying to track down where the headquarters of Blue Sky Bio was from their website to contact them about sponsoring the show. I was having a hard time. There was a few different addresses. Turns out they don't have some crazy big headquarters with all this real estate consuming all this money. And other than the fulfillment center, there's really no location to pay for. So maybe when you're starting off, it's an advantage to have a rep who comes out to your office to teach you. So if you haven't done a residency, you're not comfortable with placing, you're confused by all the components. Sure, that's great to have a rep. But once you've got your placement down, you're feeling a whole lot more comfortable. That's when it's time to spread your wings and move on. And if you feel guilty, like, oh, but my rep, blah, 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 blah. You'll see how many times reps switch companies, they quit, they move on. It's not like that one person, you now are indebted to them for the rest of your life. They helped you, you helped them, great, you move on, that's business. If you're ready to stop paying for the overhead of large companies, go to blueskybio.com slash store. If you're overwhelmed by the options, you can't go wrong starting with the Biomax line. With one narrow platform for all their implants, it makes restoring and placing that much simpler. BlueSkyBio.com. Okay, we have with us again, this is part two with Adam McWethy, who's the VP of marketing at Spear Education. He developed their online education platform and is the co-author of the book. I've got the book right in front of me where I have the cheat sheet, Case Acceptance in the Modern Dental Practice. And since we're doing an entire season on case acceptance, and he wrote an entire book with Frank Spear on this. We are having you back. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. I uh, I can't believe you would actually want to talk to me again. I know. Me neither. No, we had such a great time that first time. That was fantastic. And I had a ton of fun. And we want your knowledge. You have so much depth of experience in this. And, and we've stolen, just so everyone knows the context, this is Voices of Dentistry. We've stolen the Dental Hacks booth. So it's actually being used for something intelligent productive now. yeah 
So I just I just feel like we need some more fart jokes or butt jokes or I'm, something. You know what? We can we can totally do that. Uh, we in, can work that in. in. Yeah, we'll figure it out. With J Lips and, and Alan, their presence is felt here. So yeah, I have an eight year old boy, so that's kind of my <laughs> life outside of here. So I'm pretty good at it. Nice. If you yeah. can work in some dad jokes too, yeah, no, we really really appreciate all it. I've got. Absolutely love. And actually, my co-host George. So um, George is the type that when we were first podcasting together, we just met for the first time last night in person. We've been co-hosts for two years now. Okay. And never met in person. Wow. So this has now occurred. This is like the most important thing for me at Voices of Dentistry is that I got to meet George. He's not here today because his wife is giving birth like any minute. Like she was in labor pains in the- Where? I i don't understand his priorities then. I know. Like podcasting, Voices of Dentistry. Right. She's a dentist as well. So they, they have a, a, a practice here in Phoenix. And so, you know, she was like in the back room, miserable. And we were having dinner late last night after they almost lost my bags. But he is the type, this is a long story, but I want you to understand the backstory. All right. That when he would listen to a podcast, he'd be sitting down at his computer taking notes. And so if there was like banter, like we're doing right now, he'd be really frustrated. He'd be like, <laughs> he'd be like, come on, get to the point. I'm like setting aside time to listen to this podcast. George has the most brilliant analytical mind. He loved our episode that we did last time. So uh, when George loves an episode, like in my mind, that's like the pinnacle of like we've delivered value. So I just wanted to let you know oh, that, well. that my co-host absolutely loved the content that we right. provided last time. So thank you for coming back. All right. So like literally, I want to go through your book and extract as many skills and as many frameworks and ability to increase case acceptance in, in people's office. And we talked a lot about the, the tools that Spear has, mm -hmm. but let's get into the actual yeah. models that you guys have developed. Yep. So how did you structure this book? Like, What was your overall plan? So really where the book came from is I have spent a long time looking at a lot of the research around persuasion and around communication, especially effective persuasive communication, and really trying to understand that because of the amount of time I spent training sales teams, right? Specifically sales teams in industries where you are not buying something you have to have, but it's really a value sell. And so I came to Spear and started listening to Frank, obviously, sure. and understanding his co-discovery model and really understanding what he was doing. And what I realized was Everything that Frank does is exactly what I would tell someone to do huh. based upon the social science research. Okay. Right. So he's already implementing it, even if he didn't yep. know the research to back it up. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it's all based on Barclay stuff from before, but it, it is actually exactly how you need to work with people and exactly how we would teach people oh. because the goal with case acceptance, and I think where most dentists struggle is a couple of different places, is one, there's fear, right? And the fear comes from you hearing no from patients over and over again, especially when patients, you know, get really resentful, Sure, right? Which is totally understand. The other part is that when you present treatment to somebody, if they don't accept right then, the story that a lot of dentists tell themselves is they're never going to do it. Mm. And so... What the co-discovery model teaches is that our job, or your job as a dentist, not actually a dentist, is to make people aware of what's going on. And so what's interesting is this is, in medicine, you see people do this a lot because they're not concerned because of the way insurance works in medicine. The doctors are not concerned about are they going to move forward or are they not going to move sure. forward. So if I went into a dentist, or if I went into a doctor, and, you know, I got a physical and they were looking at the report from my physical and they were like, ah, should I tell him about the cholesterol or should I tell him about the triglycerides? Because <laughs> I don't think he's going to do anything about the triglycerides. So I'm just going to tell him uh, about the cholesterol. We'd sue them for right, malpractice, right? right? But in dentistry, that tends to be how people approach. Yeah. And a lot of it is because of the way things are presented, people recoil or people don't understand. And so what what I was hoping to do with this, because a lot of what I hear from our customers and our clients is, all right, I get this idea of, okay, co-discovery, but how do I do it? Okay. And who do I do it to? 
And so what Frank and I tried to do was I said, Frank, here's all the research. Help me show people examples of where this works and what you've said so that we can go from this theoretical understanding of, okay, I need to do these two. All right, I understand there's some science behind this. Now, here are the exact things that I need to say. And so that was really the goal of the book was to kind of marry the two so that people understood it. What Frank is doing is it's not a theory. It's what we've been, Frank's been teaching for 30 years. So we know anecdotally how well this works. But then also to be able to say, here's the science behind it and this is why it works. And so that was really the goal of the book was to kind of marry those two. Well, and and I love that you have dived into the research and the literature behind this Mm -hmm. because like that's what we want you know it feels very validating to be like okay we're using a process that's backed up by research i also think that that makes us feel better about like studying sales if we're doing research Mm -hmm. versus versus uh like other other sources of sales knowledge but i loved i'm trying to find this quote that i that i wrote down where people say here we go but i'm a doctor i shouldn't be selling anything he says The fact is many parts of dentistry must be effectively sold to patients because the majority of the costs for rehabilitative procedures come directly out of pocket. So having the research behind it, it's not like we're following around used car salesmen and and learning what they do and following any, you know, weird tactics or anything like that. This is like how we help people come along a journey. Right. Because this is, I think this is where the confusion comes in is, so if you look at dentistry as a whole, right? 48% of all of the dollars spent on dentistry are out of pocket. Yeah. And what you are actually asking people to do to spend money is to allocate resources, right? Time and money. Those are the two resources you're asking them to allocate towards their oral health. And the challenge with dentistry is that the reality is if I don't choose to move forward with something immediately in 90% of cases, nothing's going to happen to me in the next two, three weeks. Yeah. And so, you know, you think about the other messages that these people have, they're similar, right? I know that I should sleep more. I know that I should eat less sugar. I know that I should do these things. All of those things too are in the back of my head. I know I should do them. But if I, realistically, if I don't do them, nothing's going to happen to me sure. in the next couple of weeks. And so what we really want to do is help people to, one, know what's going on first. Because if you don't know, you're definitely not going to allocate resources to anything. And the second thing is help them to understand what happens if you choose not to move forward, because that's a choice that everybody has. And so really what, you know, when we talk about selling, it is about we want the patients to value their oral health to the same level that you as the clinician value your oral health. Which is hard to do. Right. So... I, I want to try something. And, mm-hmm. and I love some of the really specific verbiage around this in one of these cases here mm-hmm. where Frank is doing co-discovery, but he's asking permission along the way to let the patient know what he sees Yep. so that there's no weird pressure to it. Yep. And so the patient is asking for you to give them information. So let me try and do this yeah. and, and butcher it. Yeah. And then you like train me. Got it. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. So... um. In this case, there was a lady who came in who she was worried about her front two teeth. There were some other things. And and you're worried about like, do I scare them away? But you want to ask if if we can do some more. So he says, I know you didn't ask me about the appearance of your other teeth. So if you're happy with how they look, can we skip this part of the tour? So if if the patient has the ability to say, so you're you're basically giving the permission, the, the patient permission to not get more information. You're like, hey, we have a priority here. These are your, the teeth that you came in to talk about. Mm-hmm. I'm seeing some other things here. Do you want me to skip the other things and just focus on those front two teeth? Or do you want me to tell you everything that, that I see? Yep. Am I saying that right? That's really close. So the part that is really important actually happens upstream from this. Okay. So what the front office needs to be trained to do is with new patients coming in, and I'm going to just stick with new patients because it's... And we, we talked about this yep, a little bit last yep. time, kind of that filtering question of, are you looking for just addressing this one problem? Yep. Or are you looking for us to tell you everything? You kind yep. of have the time and attention and, and a willingness exactly. to do that. So that's the first step. The second thing is, is that when that patient sets that appointment, the front office needs to consistently be able to say, 
this is what is going to happen in this appointment so okay. that you've set expectations. Because really where you get the most pushback from people is when they have an expectation about what's going to happen and you don't meet that. So Frank uses a great example where he says, if you look at any restaurant that you go to, you have an expectation walking in there. Yeah. So if it's McDonald's, right? Like you have an expectation of, they don't have to do much to right. be the most amazing McDonald's. But if the patient understands, I'm going to look at stuff in your mouth, I'm going to tell you what I see, then they're prepared for that. So it makes this conversation easier. Even easier. Yeah. So now what you do is you come in and you say, you first of all, you have to acknowledge their chief complaint okay. or the thing they get complained because otherwise they feel super invalidated. For instance, if I walk into a car dealership, I need someone to help me find the car for me. If I say you know, I care about safety, I care about fuel economy, and then you run me over to sports cars, right. you've shown that you're not listening to me. <laughs> right. And, right off the bat. You know, I have an expectation about what car dealers do when I walk in there. So you have reaffirmed that. So with this question, you say, look, we looked at all these things. I can definitely take care of this thing that you have. I see some other stuff. If you want, I can share that with what I see and then you can make a decision about where we go from there. And so, so then as the patient, I, you know, I'm able to say, okay. And now what happens with that? So here's the interesting part. So there's a theory called cognitive dissonance. I talk about it a little bit in the book. But the original research, and, and we may have touched on this last time, but the original research basically showed that your actions and your beliefs cannot be, can't be disconnected. Okay. And so what that is, it creates what's called dissonance. So the original research, what it did is they brought students into a lab and they made them crank a handle for no apparent reason for, and your audience can't see I'm cranking. He's cranking. Yeah. So they made Working them crank a handle for a time period and it was miserable. And so one group on the way out, they saw somebody coming in and the Suppose the person who was running the experiment said, hey, I know that was really boring. Can you please tell this person it's fun because I'm not going to get them to do anything. And what they found was, and then they did a post afterwards and the control group didn't do anything. So what they found was they were actually able to change people's perception of how actually fun it was <laughs> when they brought them back later because they said that. So they, okay, so they had to say it themselves. Yep. They're convincing someone else that it's fun. Yep. And so they've like mentally, if they don't accept that, then they feel like they're, the dissonance is there that yep. like, oh, well, it must have been fun because I just told someone else it was fun. Right. And so what we're doing with this is where I say to you, is it okay if I move forward? One, if they really don't want to hear, it's great. And then you know and you can move on. But in 90% of cases, people are going to say, yeah, that's fine because... We always want to know what's going on yeah. with us. We may not know that's what we want, but then once that person gives you permission to move forward, now they're engaged because their brain can't actually handle, I agreed to listen to this and I hate them at the same time. Right. Like, and I think this is crap. Like, so you've actually moved them into a place where they're ready to hear and listen because they had that affirmation. Okay. So always asking permission before you go on to something I want to take some pictures because we saw X. I know that's not what you talked about. Is that okay? And now all of a sudden, the patient is engaging with you. And when it comes to the ultimate decision, because I know that sounds kind of like, oh, we're manipulating people with psychology or whatever. But the reality is when it comes to the final decision, they're going to make the decision they're going to make. Sure. And it's going to be based on their situation at the moment, their finances, all these things that are going on. But if you don't get them into a headspace where they can hear it, they don't actually know what, how to value different things in their life. It, it's like they're, I feel like if pe people aren't in that mode, there's a lot going on in their head. They're like thinking about, uh, is, do I trust this? Is this real? What is important to me? And if yep. they can't even like sit there and just process it, yep. they're not even really taking in what you're saying. Yeah. And so I just want to state the number one thing, all of what all the research says in any sort of persuasion attempt or selling or anything is if you are lying or if you are doing things that are unethical, that will kill all of this. That's awesome. If like this only works if you're actually presenting things patients need. Hmm. If you can actually treatment plan and if you can understand what's going on, if what you're saying is 
not realistic, especially if that's verified. All this backfires and they will leave your practice. They will tell everybody you're a charlatan. So that was really Shakespearean of me. That was good. I liked it. But so the thing is, is first and foremost, if they don't need something yeah. or something's not real or you're making a bigger deal out of something than it needs to be. They're going to pick up on it. This all backfires yeah. and you destroy all trust. And what, again, the elaboration likelihood model says is that if we destroy trust, that cements their belief system pretty much permanently. So the thing to understand is I am I'm not saying these are tricks that will get patients no. to move forward. What I'm saying is if they actually need it, this will help you overcome all the other messages they're getting everywhere else. Because probably that day somebody told them, oh, you need to lose weight. And sure. here's this magic pill or machine that they will were do on, that. They were on Instagram. So of course they saw that. Or, you know, hey, if you do this financial thing, it's going to solve all your debt. Or, you know, I can people, teach. People are used to just filtering out messages yep. all the time. Yeah. So what we need to do is we need to rise above all of the noise and the guilt that people are walking around with on a daily basis. Okay, so I, I love that. Let, let's go into, so one of the things I, I liked was the checklist that Frank sets up in this for the appearance concerns when you're doing the exam. So he's got a, a mental checklist that he's going through and basically going through each phase. And if they have something... So to speak to the checklist specifically, yeah, the reason that you use a checklist is that what that does to people is it people are used to seeing it then becomes not just your opinion or arbitrary. Now it is we go through this with everybody and there is something that shows you that is what they do with everybody. So because one of the things that can be really challenging is if I come in, I'm going to use the car thing, for example, if I come in and I don't feel like I'm getting a different deal than somebody else is getting, yeah. then I, I feel like I must be the root, right? And so people feel that a lot too, that they feel like they're a mark. My, my buddy has expressed, uh, this is another shout out to Caleb, that his deepest fear in life is being taken advantage of. Like, so getting like screwed over by someone. Mm -hmm. So that, that sense that like, I'm getting a bad deal or like, this isn't fair. Like that's deep seated in people. Yep. Yeah. And so when we use a checklist, it removes that from it because dentists are actually doing this anyway, right? So when you evaluate someone's mouth, you have a series of things that you look at and go through. All we're doing is letting the patient know that's what we're doing, right? So it's, again, when you go into like Jiffy Lube or whatever, they've got a checklist, right? Again, I know that some of those things they want to sell me and some of them, whatever, but they go through that same checklist with me every time. Yeah. So I know that's just what they have to do. And since you're doing this anyway, when you do the exam, let's just let the patient know that's what we're doing. Right. Because again, that's, that's where the disconnect comes, right? Is the patients don't know why. They don't know why you're looking at all these things or why you're showing it and nobody else did. And so one of the theories that we also talk about in here is called the persuasion knowledge model. And what that says is that every attempt at persuasion that happens to you, it changes the way that you view the next persuasion attempt. So what you as a dentist need to understand is that your patient, when they react to something you say, it's probably not about you. Mm. It is about every dentist that has ever talked to them since they were six or five or whenever sure. they can remember sure. it. And so that's the other thing to understand is why you have to set very clear expectations for why. Because when they come into your practice, you know, they have an assumption about what dentistry is. And so you have to educate them about what your dentistry is. And it doesn't have to take forever. It's a two minute conversation to just own your value. So let's let's talk about the elaboration likelihood model. And I just want to point out that this has to be from research because that's like the worst phrase. Like when my brain hears elaboration <laughs> likelihood model, yes. like it like shuts off halfway through because I'm like, I have no clue what this means. Yep. So let's break down okay. what, what elaboration likelihood model is. Okay, so what the elaboration likelihood model does is it looks at all of the social science research on persuasion and communication in general and puts it into a single theory that we can understand. So basically what it says is that we have two types of decisions. So we have what's called a high elaboration decision and a low elaboration decision. And a high elaboration decision is something where the stakes are higher. Either it's financial, there might be personal, there may be social implications, but there is more pressure. So choosing a divorce attorney, 
high elaboration decision, right? Buying a clock radio, low elaboration. And so what the model says is that you need to approach persuasion differently in both of those cases because how people perceive things and, and what they do changes based on how, how many consequences are going on. So if we think about dentistry in general, so you're dealing with a perception of pain, okay. right? Because what dentists do tend to hurt. You know, it is what it is. You know, you're dealing with a financial aspect, right. which will raise... Which is also painful. Yep. And you're dealing with some generalized anxiety sure. that, that people tend to have. So, you know, you're moving up and down that scale pretty quickly. So a low elaboration decision in dentistry, for instance, would be a filling. Something that's covered by insurance. 100% covered by insurance. I've had experience doing that before. I know what the deal is. So pretty low elaboration. Meaning you don't have to pull out all the stops in terms of like going nuts on convincing them all of the research behind decay yep. or you know yep. what's going to happen if they don't do this. You can kind of just rattle off. Yep. Um, and, and I liked how you guys talked about when, when it's a low elaboration decision, having just like a bunch of things you can kind of say real quick mm -hmm. saying, you know, here's what's going to happen if you don't do it. Most of our patients take care of this, you know, and yep. we can get it done real quick for you, blah, blah, blah. Your insurance will probably cover this. Yep. Having like multiple factors in their mind, if they can just say, check, check, check. You know, it's like for me, when I'm shopping for something on Amazon, it's got a ton of five-star reviews. It's a decent price. Yeah. It's on sale. Yep. Then I'm like, oh, okay, bye. So it's a very low elaboration yep. decision. But the thing to understand too is that your patients are perceiving what are called peripheral cues. Okay. So the professionalism of your office, right? The, the waiting room as they come in, all of that is setting the tone for those low elaboration decisions. So if they come into your office and you're running 20 minutes behind or your front office is short or your hygienist is selling them Amway or kind sure. of whatever the deal is, yeah. right? <laughs> now, even a low elaboration decision, they're going to question. Because okay. the peripheral cues are telling them, yeah, this doesn't, this doesn't make sense. So it's almost like all along the way, if everything like checks out mentally as they're going through your office, yep. everything lines up. They're having a great experience. Everyone, it just is a good place to be. The, the team is really warm and welcoming and focusing on the right stuff. Then they're more likely to kind of put this decision in a low elaboration state. More likely. Or if it is a low elaboration decision, they're not going to, they're just going to move. Do you feel like there are people that are just low elaboration people and, and higher elaborate, like, because I'm the type that if I'm going to buy a practice in five years, I'll start a podcast about it five years before. Right. That's my high elaboration model. Yes. For, and there's, there's people like that. Have you, is there any research around that that you saw? So the research I've seen is that Again, what's high elaboration, low elaboration is always going to vary between individuals. Okay. So there's some general things that we can understand about decision making within that model that will help us. So the thing to understand, especially when you're, and I'll remove the elaboration part of it, but when you're doing attempting persuasion on somebody, you need to take into account their, their ability to understand what you're saying at that moment, right? So are they on their phone? Are they exhausted? Are they sick? Their mental state yeah, at that moment. So then it doesn't matter if it's low elaboration or high elaboration to a certain extent, but it's more important with high elaboration. But if I can't hear what you're saying because I'm somewhere else, right. it, it doesn't matter how good your persuasion is. So the second thing I need to understand is, are they ready to hear? So that's again where awareness and expectations come in. So if you're just showing the patient what's going on and you say, here are the things I see. If you want to talk about what we can do to move forward, I'd love to have that conversation. You've now made them aware. So it could be an appointment down the road. It could be something else where you are revisiting those, those things. Because generally speaking, what we know from marketing research is five to eight times you have to tell somebody something before it actually registers and they begin to internalize anything. So no different with your patients, right? Like if they came in expecting a cleaning and you're like, hey, we're going to take all these pictures. I'm going to do all these other things. Now, one, if you didn't set those expectations, you're going to put them on their heels you're not going to persuade them at that moment, period. Yeah. If you set the expectation, you said, here are all the things I see, you don't have to do anything with this right now, then all of a sudden you remove that sort of zero-sum game and the patient can actually consider things and you can start following up with them going forward. One of my best friends, Abe, went to go try on some loops with Q-Optics and he sent me a text of his angle of declination from the side. So there's this picture of him with his old loops on and then a new picture with the Q-Optics loop on. His question was, is it really this big of a difference? It was about a 15 degree difference in how far forward 
he was having to angle his head. He's going from like a, with the Q optics loops on, he had almost like a slightly forward neutral head position. With his old loops, he you could tell he was leaning his head forward and was having to strain his neck every single day to do dentistry. So to answer the question, is it really that big of a difference? Yes, absolutely. 15 degrees, it's huge. He was, he was blown away. He's loved them, I've loved them, you should try them out. If you want to test run a pair of Q-Optics loops against your old loops, email sales at qoptics.com and include the promo code SP19 to get a discount off your loops and light combo. So something just clicked for me when you were talking about this. I think sometimes people see case acceptance as like a single appointment thing that goes on so that basically if the patient comes in, they're getting their exam, they're in the chair, this is the moment. Right. And instead, we should look at case acceptance as as an ongoing process. Absolutely. A multi-appointment thing that doesn't have to happen this appointment or next appointment or even this year. But if everything we do along the way is building towards that and making the patient feel comfortable, they're on board with what you're sharing with them, they understand, but there's no pressure, then it's it's a process that we're walking them through. And whether there are, some people are ready to accept treatment now and some people are ready to accept treatment later, but I, I think we pigeonhole ourselves and we put more pressure on the situation than we need to when we think like, today's the day, I got to convince this patient that yep. they need this large treatment plan. Well, and that's why, again, we launched our consulting business is because if you are struggling to find hip payroll, or cover your overhead, yeah. and you don't know how to how to get to that next step. None of this is going to play in. So I, I call that desperation breath. When right. when you're like you need people to say yes, your case acceptance suffers. Yep. So let's talk about then if we have just to wrap up a elaboration model. If we have a high elaboration model patient, aka we're presenting a large treatment plan. Yep. And patients are, are going to need to process this and need to have all these check marks for them to move forward. Yep. What are some other skills that we can have to help people through that high elaboration process? Great. So again, the, the biggest thing that you need to think about is you when you go into a high elaboration decision, all of a sudden you become much more rational in the decisions that you make. So this is where you're going to need evidence. You're going to need facts and figures. You're going to need, you're going to need to understand. Photos and- yeah, you're going to need to understand it much more intensely. Low elaboration. I'll take your word. You're the doctor. We move on. That's your classic authoritarian model. Sure. When you get into higher elaboration decisions, you need to understand that they're going to have to think about it, right? And so what's interesting about this process, you, you said it a minute ago, some patients, You'll start the process of be like, yeah, I get it. Here, I'm going to write you a check. No big deal. You're going to get those in sales. We used to call them laydowns. Sure. But you're going to get those from time to time, and that, that's neat. But most people aren't going to function like that. And you also don't know how far the patient has taken themselves on the buyer's journey. Right. So it may be by the time, you know, you mentioned something two years ago, they've been researching it on the internet. They've been doing all this other stuff. And then they come back in and they're, they're ready to move forward. And it feels like it was just a miracle, but it was seed you planted a couple of years ago. So the, the main thing that I recommend is that this is where in bigger cases, especially you try to find a time to do the consult separately Okay. because you're bringing the patient in, in a place where they can focus because they're dedicating it to it. They're open to listening. They've committed to hearing about what's going on. And that's where you can really present, here's what we're going to do. The other part is, is from what Frank talks about is, and this is where I think a lot of people get confused in co-discovery is I make you aware, right? So I tell you what's going on and then I tell you what happens, what is possible without recommending a procedure. So at this point, like if you came in and I said, okay, your gums are bleeding, you've got these pockets, here's what this means, here's what happens if you do nothing, there are things we can do to stop this in its progress and hopefully help your body to heal. Would you like to hear about those options? So I'm not saying you have periodontitis, you need SRP, Right. we're going to do that tomorrow. I'm saying, there's a, here's what's going on. We can make it better. Do you want to hear about that? And now all of a sudden the patient is, I've taken money out of it. I've taken fear out of it. I've taken like, and they'll ask you, they'll say, well, how much does that cost? And what you do at this point is just say, you know, that is something my front office can help you with, you know, there's varying 
cost to all of this, what your insurance will cover, how much extensively we have to go. So there's, I can never quote you an exact price, right? but you know, I, if you want, I'll just show you what's possible. And then we can talk about that. There's also a bunch of different ways we can pay for things or we can, you know, you can just kind of give them those options, but you acknowledge their concern about cost and then you move on to the next, next thing. And okay. so that, that's a big deal. Let me, let me see if I can do this. So okay. you just did it and I need to do it back because otherwise okay. I, I think I know how to do it, but then I don't actually yep. do it to your side. So what I, I'm seeing some bleeding, I'm, I'm seeing some depth of pockets. I mean, we, we've got some bone loss around your teeth. I'm seeing a lot of evidence of, of disease. We can do things about that and we can stop the progress of this. And we have some ways to, to allow your body to heal and repair itself. Is that something you're interested in hearing about? Do you want to hear... I feel like you said it better. What did you say? Ah. Do you want to hear what's possible? Do you want to hear what's possible? Yeah. And then I'll say, well, how much does that cost? You're like, you know, we can definitely figure out a way to make this work and fit in your life. I'll show you what's possible. Our front desk can talk about what your insurance is going to cover, what it's not, you know, all of that. And that's definitely something we want to be very conscious of. But are you okay if we move forward with showing you what's possible? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's it. So I, again, I acknowledge that cost is a factor because I think also too, like, so you, Periodontitis is a little bit easier because insurance is going to cover a lot of sure. SRP and stuff like that. But if, you know, I'm talking to you especially about aesthetics, right? It would be, you know, you've you kind of mentioned you've got these other things going on. There's a lot going on. And you say to me, well, how much is that going to cost? And you say, there are, you say, it's like buying a car, right? Okay. There is a car for 12000 that will get you from point A to B. There is a car for 100000 that will get you there very fast and have lots of different options. We have a lot of options in dentistry and based on materials and time and kind of what you want to do. So I can't tell you how much that's going to cost. What I can tell you is how much it's going to cost to find out. And so then you say, I'm going to have to bring you back. I'm going to do models. I'm going to do this. It will cost you $500 to find out what's possible. And obviously, if you move forward with treatment, that'll come off of whatever we end up doing. Okay. And so now what you've done with that is you've removed from the patient, like, yes, it costs money, but you've also said here, this is, you're getting a small commitment from them yeah. to do all the work that needs to happen to work the case up and give them options. Because the reality is with an aesthetic case, it could be composite and equilibration. It could be 20 units, right? you know, and you, so you've got to figure it out for the patient and present them those options okay. and the why. But you know, you're saying there's so much variability in what we do. Can I try it? Sure. Okay. So, okay, so you ask the question first. You ask how much is it going to cost? How much is it going to cost? Okay. So we have different options. And just like buying a car, there's a car that'll be 12 grand. They'll get you point A to B. And there's a car that's going to be a hundred grand. That's going to get you from A to B. What I can do is tell you how much it'll cost to give you an idea of what your case is going to involve. Because this has to be custom to you. And we have to figure out what needs to occur to get you from point A to B. So I can tell you the cost of what that is going to take to give you that information. And then we can decide at that point, are we going to move forward with this bigger treatment plan? Is it, is it going to be smaller? And anything that we, we charge now will apply towards that future treatment plan. Yep. And the only, the only thing I would add to that Please is... Please critique me. Yeah. So the only thing down. I would add to that is to help them understand the steps that you go through. So okay. to say, we're going to have to get photos, we're going to have to get models, we're going to have to do a scan, you know, I'm going to have to plan where everything... So you kind of help them understand it's Speak not the just... the diagnostic yeah, into so that. Yeah, so you just want to help them to understand, like, there's a bunch of stuff I have to do. And again, analogies are good. You say, you know, it's hard for a general contractor to tell you how much a remodel is without coming, coming in out and, and looking at everything, measuring everything. And, you know, and there's options. So again, if you can help them to, and then you have the option as the dentist to, if they're like, oh, I don't want to pay this to find out or whatever, yeah. you know, you can, you can always then say, well, you know, if you really want to find out, let's, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. You know, I can give you some ideas, right? So, cause there's things you can do if you have pictures, obviously sure. you can put some teeth on them and show them, but you know, you're setting the expectation that my planning is and my time to figure this out has value. Right. Because I think we shall, we sell ourselves short there. Yep. And, and if, especially if you're trying to do more of these cases, but you're giving that away from, they're not willing to 
pay for a little bit of diagnostics, mm-hmm. that's a good filtering spot to like decide, is this person going to move forward to treatment? Why am I going to spend four hours and yep. depression material and all this stuff? Yep. Not that it would take that long, but that same idea of, of chair time and attention and thought process, treatment planning. Yep. So that's great. And, and that kind of tests their willingness. I really like these role plays. What if, what language, going back to this idea, I really like this idea that case acceptance isn't a single appointment thing And for larger cases, sometimes this is going to take time. What can we say when we, so say that we we go ahead, we get all the models, we take the photos, we do the scans. Now we've got the big treatment plan. What can we say to give them the option to do it now or later? Like not that, how, how can we leave that open? Yep. So Steve Ratcliffe has a great phrase that he uses, which is in me talking about dentistry, he says, when you're talking about quality dentistry and the price of quality dentistry, there are is really one variable, which is time, okay. right? So what we can always help the patients to understand is there's ways we can phase treatment, there's things we can do temporarily. And so kind of as you're talking to the patient and you're saying, this is what is possible, you're saying how we get there is up to you. And you just have to make them aware of the possibilities that, hey, we could do these teeth in composite today. We could look at two years down the road, doing them in porcelain. We could, you, you've got to present all of those options to them and show them pictures of other patients that have been through that. So, you know, it's during the presentation, just acknowledge this is a big decision, right? I understand it's a lot to think about. I understand you think through. I want you to, Tell me what is what seems reasonable and what's not from your perspective. Because the goal with any of this is to make sure that you're doing what's most appropriate for you based upon your circumstances at this moment. So, you know, the the thing with it is to again just we always acknowledge, and you'll notice in the phrasing that I use there, I didn't say this is expensive, this is gonna take a long time. I changed the framework to say this is a big investment. Yeah. You know, so we're able to acknowledge like, this is a lot to think about. I don't expect you to make a decision right now. And that sets everybody at ease. And, you know, the challenge is then your office has to have really good systems of notation and follow-up. Because what we see when we bring some of these practices into Spear Practice Solutions is, if you look in EagleSoft, there's 16 million in treatment plans, Uh. right? And so... If you're never following up with somebody and you're not saying, you know, you're saying, hey, but you can set those expectations too to say, I understand you're going to think about it. Is it okay if I have my office manager follow up with you in a couple of days to see where you're at? Or how would you like? So you're setting an expectation for follow up as well. That's the other thing is it's all about setting expectations. Okay. And then making sure you exceed those expectations. So let me let me try this again because okay. I, I I I always think I can do it and then I say it and I'm like man Adam said it better. So you're you're talking about a, a larger case and so you, I want to acknowledge it. this is a big investment for you and and we know that and we want you to have an understanding of the options and we want to fit this in your life and so how did you I'm going to break out here so how did you talk about the time thing you said it so well what did you so, say so say. One of the biggest variables within dentistry is the time we take to do things. So it's going to cost you X amount if we do it all in two appointments. But it may be that we can phase parts of this treatment over the next couple of years to help you reach your goal without having it impact you as much today. Okay. So, So, okay, let me try that. So we can control how long this takes. This this can be either something we do rather quickly if you've got like a wedding in two months that you want to have all this done for or if we need to phase this over time over the next two years to fit this in so that you can make this investment in yourself and not feel the pressure of having to do all that at once. But at the same time, we want to give you time to think about this and we want to follow up with you. Is that okay if we follow up after you've had a moment to process this and, and talk to your spouse or whatever you need to do? Yep. Okay, any any critique there? No, I think that's good. I mean, I think the other thing is, you know, you can also just, you know, once you do that, it's, hey, unless, of course, you think you're good to go and we can get you scheduled for your next appointment. Okay. So again, we always want to give them that option to just, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, we don't want to automatically give them a soft no out. Yep. So, you know, what we want to say is like, again, it's up to you. It's always up to you. But, you know, if you, 
you know, and again, you can look at what they said their reasoning for it is. So if there is a wedding or there is something, just let them know. If you actually want this done by X date, we can do that. Here's where we would have to start. Yeah. And so you'd have to make that decision sooner. If, you know, there's going to be ortho and there's going to be all this other stuff involved, then, you know, you can kind of, there's not going to be the urgency to get it done. But also if there is within the, so if I say, hey, I want to get all my teeth done, so I'm a pretty bad wear case, right? So there are certain teeth of mine that we have to treat sooner rather than later because the dentin's exposed, they're going at a big rate. And so you just need to explain that during the presentation. And okay. Frank does that with the numbers. So he says, this tooth is a one, we got to deal with it now and here's why. So if you've got mobility, if it's going to need a root canal, if it's going to do this, say, these things we have to do to keep your teeth you know, these things we can probably wait on and watch. And, so the yeah. number system is teeth that need to be tr treated first, get the one, mm -hmm. they're the priority. Teeth that are elective, but still... Are teeth not that probably will need to be treated in the next year or so. That's the two. Yeah, and then three is if you want to. We okay. could do things. So you look at somebody with, you know, a big amalgam or gold, right? And you could say, if you want that gold removed, we could do that. This amalgam looks fine. They can last for 20 years. But if you want that out of there, we can do that. But, you know, it's just something to... So that's kind of where you would, would help them to kind of understand. Prioritize yeah, and phase yeah. things. So how about some language for those practices that you mentioned earlier that have these large cases that they've treatment planned and now the patient's back a year later or, or two years later and that's still like we had that conversation before. Mm -hmm. How do you bring that up? Not awkwardly, you know, like how do you yeah. bring it up and give them permission? Let's to talk about it again and also to not talk about it if they're if they're not into it. So I think I think part of it is, is it depends on the case, right? So if I recommended stuff because of where, for instance, it would, you know, it would be just remind them, you know, these teachers are watching. They seem to have lost this much more, you know, probably gonna be fine tomorrow. But I just want to make sure you're aware that wear is continuing. Right. So we do it kind of on a case by case basis. If, you know, they're coming back in and it's purely aesthetics, you know, you can kind of just just bring them up. But if some, you learn something new or you've learned this to just say, hey, I know we talked about you getting veneers. Right. So I'm, you know, I went to a couple of courses about six months ago and I learned how to do this in composite. And so there may be a different option for you now that it didn't have at the time. If you want to learn about that, let's talk that through. So again, you make it all value add for the patient, right? It's either I'm concerned about something that's progressing or I've learned another solution that can help you. And again, it's all got to be real, right? right? So like if the patient comes in and, you know, they're like, I want to do everything and you quote them, you know, 20 veneers and all this stuff. And then they're just like, yeah, I'm not going to do that now. <laughs> right. And you're going to deal with that differently than somebody who's like, wow, that is a lot more than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I don't know if I can do this at this moment. So that's where the patients give you, tell you kind of how to yeah. follow up. And so it's about listening to kind of where they're at. Cause you get people who are like, oh, I'm going to do all of this, or they may have some reason that they want to show off how right. big a deal they are, you know, whatever it is. Right. So again, it's kind of on a case by case basis so that you can, but that's why charting is really important. Photographies are really important. And so you can look at the chart and make sure your whole team understands like, okay, these are the things that we recommended. These are our watches. These are this. And you just continue to use that language. Like every time I go into the dentist, he takes pictures of the same wear spots yeah. and he's like, you know, these ones I'm concerned about. So, you know, it's just, it's again about constantly keeping them aware of the progress. Because what, what we found when we did some studies on Yelp reviews and stuff is that what patients don't like is being surprised. Right. So you just don't surprise them. Like if I come in and you're like, everything's great. And the next appointment I come in and you're like, oh my God, there's all these things, right? Yeah. Like we just, we need to not surprise people. Interesting. So where, tell me a little bit more about that Yelp research. When, when did you guys do this? So we did research on, we looked at 1,200 Yelp reviews from dental practices across the country. Okay. And we did what's called a sentiment analysis on them. So we looked at positive versus negative. And then my team went through and we categorized them based on the types of things people were saying. And so what we found was 63% of negative reviews allude to communication issues. Hmm. And actually 25% of negative, so within that 63, 25% are specifically mentioned the doctor chair side. Huh. So what's cool about that is that is all stuff that's under your control. Yeah. And I understand that you're not going to fix everybody with sure. Yelp and there's crazy people. And I've heard all the stories about 
them holding hostage for retainers and oh, yeah. crap like that. But, you know, you can really start to understand like, okay, how I'm presenting to the patient, the positive reviews always mention they educated me. They really helped me to understand. They, you saw those themes through the positive. And from the negative, what you saw is abrupt, gruff, lack of professionalism. You saw those themes come through it. And so it's really, again, about am I educating people? Am I helping them to understand? And it sets the tone for everything that happens in the practice. So I think a great example is we saw one, so there was a, two Yelp reviews, both about just a hygiene appointment. And one, the patient came in and then they were told they had to come back and they had to have this other procedure done with this thing that sprayed water over them. It wasn't a real cleaning. Yeah. Right. I think we talked about this. Yeah. And so with the other one, and so both of those, that was just an explanation. Like, this if you is, have to bring someone back for gross debridement, you just need to tell them. Tell them. Like, I can't do this. Yeah. You have this gross cement over your gums that I have to get rid of before I know what's going on. Yeah. And then they can do what they want with that. And honestly, if you tell a patient that and they huff off and go, you're way better off. Yeah. Not having, not having invested all this time in somebody who won't. Accept treatment and recommendations. On something that will be covered by insurance, insurance and yeah. is pretty basic. On, on a low elaboration decision. Yeah, if right? they're not willing to move yeah. forward with that. Yeah. Like if I take a picture and I can't, the back of your teeth all looks like a single line of yellow. Yeah. You know, you should be able to figure out that. Okay. Probably not okay. I can't even see my own teeth through that. Right. This this has been awesome. I I have talked with Carson. We're going to get a link because we, we talked about it last time and I've had someone reach out to me. They're like, hey, yeah. I want that spear book. Where's yep. the link? We're getting a link. We're going to do a few of these spear episodes about case acceptance. We're going to have that in there. I still, the offer is still standing. All right. If we want to turn this into an audio book. Okay. Then, then I, I'll help you. I'll read the book. I'm not, right. I'm not the best, but, right. but I still think you guys should turn this into an audio book right. because I know maybe some some dentists that don't listen to podcasts don't listen to audiobooks. There are also people who listen to podcasts and audiobooks and can't read anymore, right? Because now we're so lazy right. and spoiled. So maybe we'll do a second edition. We'll call it the low edition. Yes, and. Yeah, we can put all this stuff in there. Well, and if if we do it at the the Dental Hacks booth, we're going to have to sneak some fart jokes into yeah, the case fine. acceptance book. I'll just be like, and I'll just, the direct quotes from Frank, I'll put them in there. <laughs> I'll be like, and then I told the patient. And then. I asked him to pull my finger and then I showed them all the. <laughs> the director's cut. Frank. Frank Spear did not authorize me to say that. Right. That is my opinion. This is, this, is, this is the real deal here. Well, perfect. Thank you so much for being willing to... Um, Get, I, I got some free coaching here. This is very right. selfish of me. And and I feel like, I like I said, you, you think in your mind, if you read a book like this, you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I can totally do that. And then you go to actually implement that in right. your practice. And you're like, oh, what did they say? So this is why role-playing is really important. Yeah. It seems silly, but if you have your team meetings and you have the team starting to role-play, it pays dividends because the other reason people stop wanting to do things is because you get in the moment and the first time I'm trying to say these things to a patient, it's much like that scene in Tommy Boy, yeah. right? Where he's like, you can get a good look at a butcher's <laughs> by sticking your head up, right? Like then all of a sudden you will not try that again. Yeah. So if you practice the phrases and you practice them as a team, then the whole office gets better at them. Perfect. I love that idea. I think that's what people are missing because it's like, if you don't sit one of your team members down and go through all this and try mm -hmm. this and role play this, it's not going to come out right the first time. So get the book. We'll have the link and then incorporate this into team meetings and, and focus on it and, and build this into your practice and, and then come work with Spear and then come to these cases, uh, these courses. And once you have the ability to diagnose and treat and the clinical skills and you can talk to your patients about these big cases without scaring them off, all of it just works together. So yeah. thank you so much for coming awesome. on the show again. A lot thank of you. fun. Take care. A huge thanks to the folks at Spear for lining all these interviews up. I really enjoy every single time, like I said last last interview last week, anytime we can talk with someone over at Spear, it's a great conversation. So this was no exception. Adam, Adam's a great friend and uh, excited for you guys to get your hands on the book, check out their online learning, their education platform. In whatever way that you get involved with Spear, whether it's the free book or, or listening to more of their episodes on other shows, or whether you want to do their online courses or in-person courses, you just, you're never going to regret getting more education through Spear. That's what I've learned. So thank you guys for hanging around. This is a great episode. We'll talk with you next week on the Shared Practices podcast.